Unfortunately, we live in an age when attacks on ships from pirates or terrorists are all too common. In many cases, the crew will not have expected that it could actually happen to them. This film will help you protect your ship and keep yourself and your fellow crew safe. On October 7, 1986, the Achille Lauro was sailing off the coast of Egypt when it was hijacked by Palestinian extremists. Holding all the passengers and crew hostage, they changed the course to travel to Tartus, Syria, and demanded the release of 50 Palestinians held prisoner in Israel. When the Syrian government refused them permission to dock at Tartus, they murdered a disabled traveller and forced the barber and waiter to throw his body and wheelchair overboard. His wife was told that he had been taken to the infirmary and didn't find out the truth until the end of the voyage. After two days of negotiations, the crew were allowed to change course back to its original destination, Port Said in Egypt, and the hijackers agreed to abandon ship in exchange for safe conduct. As a result of that attack, and the disturbing reality that a vessel can be used by terrorists to transport weapons or as a weapon itself, the IMO issued advice on anti-piracy and hijacking. But it wasn't until further terrorist events occurred, such as the attack on the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001, that the IMO and the US Coast Guard implemented measures by making contracting governments and companies responsible for the implementation of new regulations. This resulted in an amendment to SOLAS, Chapter 11, called the International Ship and Port Facility Security Code, also known as the ISPS Code. The ISPS Code is mandatory for most ships, including all passenger ships, cargo ships, and high-speed crafts of 500 gross tonnages and upwards engaged on international voyages. This also included mobile offshore drilling units, and it was also mandatory for port facilities serving such ships engaged on international voyages. The ISPS code requires vessels to have an approved ship security plan, with one mandatory section, and one section with guidelines. In the United States, parallel legislation was enacted through the US Maritime Security Bill. By successfully completing this module, you will be able to identify the main requirements of the ISPS code, the essential contents of the ship security plan, and the main security duties for shipboard personnel. Recognizing the actions to take for the most common security threats, you will also identify the security measures needed at different security levels. An Automatic Identification System, or AIS, is a device that transmits information about your ship and receives the same from other ships. Information such as call sign and ship's name, speed, course, and destination can all be transmitted, and it will also be received by coast stations. The AIS is an important tool for coastal states to monitor ship traffic and to detect possible threats. According to the SOLAS Convention, an AIS must be fitted on all passenger ships and all ships of at least 300 gross tonnage on international voyages. They should also be on cargo ships with at least 500 gross tonnage that are not engaged on international voyages. In the event of a terrorist attack, ship's personnel must be able to alert the authorities ashore without letting the terrorists know that an alarm has been raised. This can be through a ship security alert system, which must be capable of being activated from the bridge and from one other location. It should not give an indication on board that the alarm has been raised. 
and it should continue to transmit the ship security alert until it has been deactivated. The transmission must not be sent to other ships in the vicinity, but to a competent authority ashore. In addition to the AIS and ship security alert system, SOLAS requires the ship's identification numbers to be permanently marked in a visible place, either on the ship's hull or superstructure. They should also be marked with their identification numbers internally. And passenger ships should carry the marking on a horizontal surface visible from the air. Intended to provide an onboard record of the history of the ship, SOLAS requires ships to be issued with a continuous synopsis record. Issued by the administration, the CSR should contain such information as the name of the ship, the flag state, the date when the ship was registered with that state, the ship's identification number, the port at which the ship is registered, and the name of the registered owner and their address. In order to provide updated and current information, as well as a history of the changes, you should record any changes in the CSR. It is the company security officer's responsibility to initiate a ship security assessment. At regular intervals to ensure the ship security plan is always up to date and correct. The CSO uses this assessment to identify and evaluate existing security measures, procedures and operations, and to recognize possible threats to key shipboard operations whilst assessing their likelihood. The ship security assessment should also be used to prioritize possible threats and establish appropriate security measures. And it should identify weaknesses, including human factors, in the infrastructure, policies and procedures. All ships covered by the ISPS code must have an International Ship Security Certificate, which will be issued by the Flag State Authority after they have verified compliance and approved the ship security plan. Although this procedure can be delegated to a recognized security organization, such as a classification society, this certificate will be checked during port state controls, and the Flag State Authority will periodically audit the ship security arrangements to ensure the vessel continues to qualify for renewal. One of the main requirements of the ISPS code is the need for a ship security plan. This is a document that states the detailed procedures for the prevention and response to security threats, including different procedures for different security levels. According to SOLAS and the US Maritime Security Bill, a ship security plan must be available on all ships of at least 500 gross tonnage engaged on international voyages, including high-speed crafts and mobile offshore drilling units. The plan will include a list of restricted areas which are classed as spaces that are essential to the operation, control or safety of the ship. Typical restricted areas are the bridge, the cargo control room, the engine control room, the engine room, and spaces with access to possible water tanks, pumps, or manifolds. Restricted areas may vary from ship to ship, and it is important to remember that their number and nature depends upon the current security level. This is set by the port state and indicates what security measures should be taken. There are three defined security levels used to communicate the extent of the threat present in a port. Security level 1 is defined as normal risk. This means that minimum appropriate security measures must be maintained at all times. Security level 2 is defined as increasing risk. This means that appropriate additional security measures must be maintained for a period of time as a result of the increasing risk of a security incident. Security level 3 is defined as incident imminent. This means that further specific security measures must be maintained for a period of time when a security incident is probable or imminent, 
although it may not be possible to identify the specific target. Before entering a port, the ship's security officer must communicate with the port to find out which security level is applicable. As a ship can never have a lower security level than the port facility, a declaration of security is needed when they are at different security levels. Often in the form of a checklist, the declaration of security is an agreement reached between a ship and either a port facility or another ship with which it interfaces. It specifies the security measures that each will implement and is checked by the ship security officer in cooperation with the local port facility security officer. It also indicates whether a ship and a port facility are operating at the same security level and requires procedures for dealing with any inconsistencies. For ships that frequently call at the same port, a declaration of security for each call is not required if the ship and port have an agreement that all security measures have been taken before arrival. On board ships, certain operations are more vulnerable to hostile attacks than others. These are called key shipboard operations and include cargo and storing operations, navigation, machinery operation and steering control, and crew and passenger safety. The ship security plan must include responses for all possible threats to the security of a ship, including damage to the ship or port facility, caused by explosive devices, arson, sabotage or vandalism. Other threats include hijacking or seizure of the ship or people on board, tampering with cargo, essential ship equipment or systems, or ship stores, unauthorized access or use, including presence of stowaways, and smuggling weapons or equipment, including weapons of mass destruction. Further threats include using the ship to carry people or equipment intending to cause a security incident, use of the ship itself as a means to cause damage or destruction, and attacks at sea or from seaward whilst at berth or at anchor. In line with these possible threats, the ship security plan must include procedures and responses. These may include repelling borders or responding to the detection of stowaways or intruders, addressing a malfunction of onboard security equipment, and screening the underwater hull or searching the ship in response to bomb threats, securing all access to the ship to prevent intrusion, performing emergency shutdown of main engine to prevent unauthorized operation, securing non-critical operations to focus attention on response and alerting ship and shoreside authorities of an incident. It may also include rendering assistance to a nearby ship undergoing an unlawful act that threatens its security. Lastly, the ship security plan will probably specify the method of communication to use in the event of a security breach, an unlawful act or an emergency. This will outline the process to follow when coordinating with port response procedures. Security officers are responsible for maintaining, developing and implementing procedures in the ship security plan. First, let's look at the company security officer. This is the person located ashore in the shipping company office who has the responsibility for developing, maintaining and enforcing the ship security plan. Their role is to advise on what threats may be encountered by using appropriate security assessments and other relevant information. They also ensure that the ship security assessments and annual reassessments are carried out and that the ship security plan is developed and maintained so that it satisfies the security requirements of the individual ship. If sister ship or fleet security plans are used, they ensure the plan reflects the ship's specific information accurately. It is also the responsibility of the company security officer to strengthen security awareness and vigilance whilst ensuring adequate training for the personnel responsible for the security of the ship. They coordinate with the ship security officer and designated representative of the waterfront facility to ensure there is consistency between security and safety requirements. 
Lastly, they make sure that any alternative or equivalent arrangements approved for a particular ship or group of ships are implemented and maintained. It is left to each company to establish their own policy when it comes to giving a person the role of ship security officer. The role itself includes responsibility for the security of the ship, including the implementation, maintenance, and supervision of the ship security plan. Their duties include performing regular security inspections of the ship, proposing modifications to the ship security plan, and enhancing security awareness and vigilance on board, ensuring that adequate training has been provided to ship's personnel. The ship security officer will also ensure that all equipment associated with the security of the ship is properly operated, tested, calibrated, and maintained. They will also review and complete a declaration of security checklist when required. The last officer to consider is the port facility security officer. This is the person appointed ashore who has the responsibility for the development, implementation, revision, and maintenance of the port facility security plan. Responsible for liaising with the ship and company security officers, as well as local authorities, the port facility security officer is the facility equivalent of the ship security officer. As the ship's personnel already have designated positions and duties in the event of shipboard emergencies, the ship security plan provides for equivalent security duties as well, including the inspection, control, and monitoring of restricted areas, key shipboard operations, and visitors on board. When signing on, you will be informed about your security duties. In order to perform them effectively. Training and drills are essential. A drill should be conducted at least once every three months, or when more than a quarter of the ship's personnel have changed at any time, with crew members that have not previously participated in any drill on that ship within the last three months. This drill should occur within one week of the change. The ship security officer is then responsible for implementing a training schedule on board that will provide adequate and proper security training. This should include training on how to use security equipment, as this is likely to vary in design from ship to ship. It's important that you receive proper training on how to operate the specific security equipment on board. For example, these could be padlocks for securing restricted areas, passes for visitors on board, closed circuit television for monitoring restricted areas. And X-ray machines for inspecting luggage and stores. Duties may include detection and identification of weapons and other dangerous substances and devices. The ship management company sets the policies for the types of weapons that are allowed on board. This must be clearly stated, as any weapon that is not listed in the ship security plan is not allowed on board at any time. You must notify the ship security officer immediately. If you suspect there is a prohibited weapon anywhere on the vessel, aside from the detection of weapons, you may also be given the duty of operating security equipment. You may also be responsible for physical search methods of people, baggage, cargo, or the ship's stores. The ship security plan must contain contingency measures and standard operating procedures for different security threats. On receipt of a bomb threat against your vessel, it's essential that you follow the applicable procedures in the ship security plan, which includes assigning personnel to search designated areas of the ship, and outlining what to do if a suspicious package is found. Terrorists can disguise a bomb in many different ways. Instead of looking for a bomb, you are looking for anything irregular or suspicious. Your response to locating a suspicious object will depend on the equipment you have on the ship. Search teams should not use walkie-talkie or radio for communication or reporting. Radio waves could trigger a bomb. Use fixed internal telephones. Some vessels have specialized equipment, such as blast suppression blankets, but most will have to seek specialist advice from a competent shore authority.
You will find further details on this in the ship security plan. When searching for a bomb, it's essential that you follow the rule: eyes, not hands, as touching a bomb may cause it to detonate. If a ship is in port when a bomb warning is received, the master, ship security officer, and port security officials will discuss the situation and arrive at a collective decision and take the appropriate action. This may involve evacuation of the ship or shifting of the vessel to an anchorage. Each case will be evaluated on the prevailing circumstances and the nature of the threat. If you are required to evacuate the ship as a result of a bomb threat or similar terrorist act, this should be done in accordance with the procedure outlined in the ship security plan, which will include information on where to muster after the evacuation, the correct way to leave the vessel, and what to take with you. If your ship is approached by a small vessel which does not identify itself. It could be carrying terrorists or pirates. If at all possible, it is preferable to stop them getting on board. High-pressure fire hoses directed from the deck can be an effective deterrent. But if you are on a ship with a high freeboard, you may be able to prevent boarding by increasing speed and carrying out zigzag maneuvers. However, care should be taken as sharp maneuvers may reduce speed. If your vessel is about to enter an area known for terrorist or pirate activity, there are a number of basic precautions that may be outlined in your ship security plan. If possible, only transit these areas during daylight. If transiting during hours of darkness, navigation lights should be kept on, but all deck and floodlights should be switched off whenever possible. Transit with maximum safe speed. Post an extra lookout on the bridge. And increase radar surveillance. Post additional personnel, both as extra lookouts in other areas and to make rounds, and have fire hoses pressurized and ready around the ship's side. Experience has shown that the presence of an alert crew is an important tool in the vessel's defence. If the crew demonstrate that they are well prepared and capable of defending their ship, the pirates may think twice and break off the attack. If pirates or terrorists board your ship at sea, you should follow the applicable procedures as outlined in the ship security plan. These may include raising the general alarm and activating the ship security alert system. Broadcast May Day on VHF channel 16 and 08 to alert nearby ships and naval forces. Ensure that all passengers and crew, other than the bridge team, stay together in one safe location. Or citadel. Most importantly, do not confront the boarders. Wait for outside help. Although the gangway is the most obvious access point to the ship, there are other ways to get on board, including ladders, side ports, or climbing up the mooring ropes. To prevent unauthorized persons boarding. These access points have to be guarded. Exactly how they are guarded depends on the security level. At all security levels, everyone seeking access to the vessel must present an ID and login. At security level one, all access points have to be monitored continuously, and a security lookout and patrol should be posted. At security level two, limit the number of access points. Security lookouts or patrols should be increased, with particular emphasis on restricted areas. At security level three, limit to only one access point. Coordinate with the waterfront facility to extend access control beyond the immediate area of the ship, and perform waterside boat patrols. Use divers to inspect the underwater pier structures both prior to and upon the ship's arrival. And in other necessary situations, CCTV, intruder alarms, and security patrols are all effective measures to monitor areas both on board and surrounding the ship. 
Earlier, we learned about the restricted areas on board your ship. It's important to note that the vessel's security level will affect how they are guarded. At security level 1, the restricted areas should be locked or secured, and personnel should patrol the areas. At security level 2, the frequency of personnel patrolling the areas should be increased. And at security level 3, personnel should be posted at the areas continuously. When completing the declaration of security, the ship and port facility security officers agree on the means of communication in case of an emergency. The current security level determines the frequency by which this is checked. They should also specify backup system requirements. At security level 1, there are no requirements for communication checks or backup communication. But there must be one method of backup communication and regular communication checks at security level 2. The same is true of security level 3, though there must be more than one method of backup communication. We've looked at how security levels affect restricted areas and the declaration of security. Now we must consider embarking personnel, as this is the most common way for prohibiting weapons to get onto a ship. At security level 1, check tickets, boarding passes, work orders and ID cards to verify the reason for personnel seeking access to the vessel. Positively identify crew members, passengers, vendors, dock workers and authorised visitors prior to each embarkation and cross-reference new crew members with company on-signers information. You should also carry out body searches and inspect baggage for prohibited weapons, incendiaries and explosives on a random basis. You should follow the same procedure at security level 2, but with an increased inspection frequency on embarking persons. And at security level 3, you should inspect all embarking persons and escort all persons except crew when on board. Prohibited weapons are not only brought on board by embarking personnel, they are sometimes transported on via cargo during loading or with the ship's stores. In order to avoid weapons entering the ship through the ship's stores, it is recommended that you verify and inspect 25 to 50% of ship's stores at security level 1 and 2 increasing this to 100% at security level 3. All vessels should be aware of the risk of concealment in stores, but ship and cargo types influence security measures, with container and general cargo vessels generally being more at risk than tankers. When it comes to general cargo ships, you should verify 25-50% to of all non-containerized cargo against the cargo manifest at security level 1. This increases to 100% for security level 2 and security level 3. On container ships, you should verify 100% of the container identification numbers for loading containers and 25 to 50% of empty containers against the manifest at security level 1. You should still verify 100% of loaded containers at security level 2, but you should also verify 100% of the empty containers. And the same is true of security level 3. With tankers, the increased security levels affect how visitors are treated on board. At security level 1, you should confirm that cargo surveyors and similar visitors have positive identification to prove who they are. At security level 2, ensure that cargo personnel are not allowed on the tank deck without an escort. At security level 3, cargo personnel should only be allowed on board if their presence is essential.